We have entitled it simply, Walk About Zion. Walk About Zion. You'll find that language later in the psalm, and we'll notice it in just a minute. We have been noticing now for a couple of weeks three psalms that all have as their background Isaiah 37. They have as their background the occasion when the Assyrian army came up against Jerusalem. They were seeking to destroy Jerusalem, but God rather destroyed them. And these three psalms evidently were written in reaction to that, both in talking about God's power and talking about what God had done for His people and giving Him the thanks and the glory that is due Him. And so tonight we'll conclude uh, that section of Scripture as we complete this psalm. Psalm 48 is all about the city of God. It's all about Jerusalem. You'll see a number of references within this psalm to the city of God. Notice in verse 1, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Verse 2, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And notice as well in verse 8, as we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God. God will establish it forever. And so again and again in this psalm, we read of the city of God. We have additional names, Mount Zion being used a number of times, Zion being used a number of times in this psalm to refer to this city. But you know, as well as I do, that there's a greater city that is in mind. Yes, it is important for us to understand the city of Jerusalem and understand the history of that city, to understand how special and important that city was to the Jews but we have been given a far greater Jerusalem, and we are privileged to be citizens of it. And Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22 speaks of that Zion of which we get to be a part, and we ought to rejoice in that. And so tonight, as we look at Psalm 48, we will be talking about the physical city of Jerusalem, but we will simply be using it to talk about a greater Jerusalem. We will be using it to talk about the church and the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice in Psalm 48, in verses 12 and 13, that we have this language. It says, Walk about Zion, and go round about her. Tell the towers thereof. Mark ye well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces, that ye may tell it to the generation following. And so the inhabitants of Jerusalem are invited to walk around the city. And they're invited to admire the city, to admire what a great city it is, to look at how beautiful her walls are, to look at how strong her towers are, to think about this great city that has been so blessed by God. Now, this takes on greater meaning when you understand the background of Isaiah 37 and when you understand that the Assyrian army had come up against this city and the Assyrian army had determined that they were going to destroy this city. But we know according to the Scriptures that they were not able to shoot an arrow there. They were not able to lay a finger on the walls of the city of Jerusalem because God delivered this city. And so God's people are invited to walk around this city and to examine her walls and to see the great deliverance that God had given to them. Notice that in this psalm, we first of all see people walking around and examining things, and then we find that they are told to tell it to the generation following in verse 13. And the word tell is a word that means, literally, to score as with a mark or as a tally. You may keep score sometimes, and you may simply put a mark to represent something. There's the idea of telling this, literally marking, writing down, recording what God has done for this city. It means to inscribe, to enumerate, to record, to celebrate, to declare, to reckon, to show forth, to speak, to talk. And so they were to tell future generations about what God had done for this city, of how that God had delivered this city from the Assyrians and from others who had come up against it. And in like manner, we ought to tell our children about the church. And we ought to tell our children about what God has done for the church and how privileged we are to be citizens of the kingdom of our Lord. 
And so as we look at this chapter, we want to see three things that they were to tell future generations about the city, the city of God. They were to tell future generations about her elevation, about her preservation, and about her legislation. We'll begin by noticing her elevation. If you notice Psalm 48 in verses 1 and 2, that the elevation of the city is that which is under consideration. It says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Now we find in verse 2 that it is described as beautiful for situation. That doesn't make a lot of sense perhaps to us as we read those words. But instead of the word situation, put the word elevation. Beautiful for elevation. Literally, Jerusalem is a city that is set on a hill. Jerusalem was built on the top of four hills, became known as Mount Zion because of one of the prominent hills upon which it is located. But Jerusalem is a city that's literally built on a mountaintop, mountaintops to be exact. It is an elevated city and it is beautiful because of that fact. Now when Jesus was talking about a city set on a hill and he was talking about Christians as being the light of the world, the city of Jerusalem was the perfect illustration of that. Because Jerusalem literally was a city set on a hill. And at night, because of the elevation of Jerusalem, you could look up and see Jerusalem. You could see the lights of the city. And many times in the Bible, even when individuals are, are spoken of as, as going from the north down to the south, whenever they're going to Jerusalem, they're going up. Because the elevation of Jerusalem is higher than the area surrounding it. And so we read about the elevation of the city. Now, think about the fact that Jerusalem sits roughly 2,500 feet above sea level. And so it's an elevated city. And it is fitting that God selected this city as being the city in which the church would first be established. And you know that David was the one that made this city his fortress. It became a very prominent city in the Old Testament. It became the city of holiness because David put the ark there and God came to dwell there. His presence was there. We think about the establishment of the temple that was there and then later the establishment of the church. And we understand the significance of this great city. We understand the high and elevated place it had throughout Old Testament history. Now, notice in Psalm 48 that several times we read of the mountain in verse 1. We read of Mount Zion in verse 2. We read of the signs which suggest this elevated position or elevated place. And throughout the psalm, you'll read reference to mountain or the Mount of Zion. And so it is a very elevated place. Now, when we make the parallel between Jerusalem and what made her special because she was elevated, we have to think about what makes the church special. And one of the things that makes the church special is her elevation. God, when God built the church, built the church on a mountain. He built the church in an elevated position. In Isaiah chapter 2, in verses 2 and 3, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He'll teach us of his ways, and we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I want you to think about the description here. The church is described as the mountain of the Lord. It's the Lord's mount. Lord's mountain. Much as the description in Psalm 48 of the city of Jerusalem. Think about the fact that it would be exalted above the hills. The church was not going to be established in the valley, but rather it was going to be established above the hills. God had a high and holy and elevated place in mind for the church just as was true of Jerusalem in the Old Testament. And we need to make sure that we leave the church where God put the church. That is, that we do not bring the church down to the level of other religious institutions, because God didn't build it on the level of other religious institutions. God exalted the church. He has a special place for the church in his mind and in his heart. There are a number of reasons for that. You may consider by way of parallel Acts chapter 10, 
in verses 14 and 15, you recall that Simon Peter saw a vision of a sheep that was being lowered from heaven. And he was told to arise, slay, and eat when he saw that sheep filled with all kinds of unclean animals. And you recall that Simon Peter refused to follow the instructions of that vision, saying, nothing common's ever come to my lips. Nothing of that nature, none of these animals, I've never eaten any of these animals because they're common, they're, they're unclean. And he was rebuked and he was told, call not thou common what God has cleansed. The old law had passed away, the new law had been put into force. Things that were forbidden of the Old Testament were no longer forbidden of the New Testament. They no longer were common, they no longer were unclean, but now they all could be received with thanksgiving. But even more than that was the fact that, that Peter was calling something that God called holy, God called clean, he was calling common or unclean. Now what happens in today's world when we call the church of our Lord a denomination? When we list the church of our Lord just among the religious institutions of the world, are we not calling that which God has cleansed common or unclean? The church has been cleansed. It's not the same nature of other religious institutions. No, Jesus purchased it with his blood. Acts 20 and verse 28. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. He gave himself for it. And because he shed his blood for the church, the church holds a high. An elevated position in this world. It doesn't mean that we think that we're better than everybody else. No, that's not to be our attitude. But the church is better than other religious institutions. It's better because a better price was paid for it. The blood of Jesus was shed in order to purchase it. That isn't true of the other religious institutions of our world. But it is true of the church. You have to understand as well that the church is described as the bride of Christ. It is special because it is His bride. It belongs to Him. I hope that you think of your mate in that way. I hope that you think of your mate as special. And they're special because of the relationship that they enjoy with you. And the church is special because of the relationship that the church enjoys with Jesus. It holds an elevated position. Your wife should be elevated above other women because you chose her. You married her. You have a special love for her. And so it is with the church. Jesus married the church. She has a special place in his mind and in his heart. And he's elevated her above all others because of that, according to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 9. Now, when the Bible says, call not thou common, that which God has cleansed, the word common, among other things, means shared by all. It's common. It's shared by everyone. But when we think about the church, certainly everyone has the opportunity to be a member of the church. There's no one that is excluded from that. But is the church shared by all? Or do you have to do certain things in order to be a part of the church of our Lord? Aren't there terms of entrance? You have to be baptized in order to be a part of the Lord's church. And so it isn't something that's shared by all. It's available to all and anyone can be a member of it. But only those who meet the conditions are allowed to enter in. And so it holds an elevated place. But now let's think about the preservation of the city. If you notice in Psalm 48, beginning in verse 3, we see that Jerusalem throughout her history enjoyed God's special protection. God protected her, preserved her. It says, God is known in her palaces for a refuge. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled and hasted away. Fear took hold upon them there, and pain as of a woman in travail. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Now here's the special protection that God has given to the city down through our history. God has been a refuge for this city. He's been a hiding place for this city. There have been great nations that have come up against the city, and yet they've been unable to destroy this city. In fact, they were only able to destroy the city when God allowed them to do so. 
God's people were carried away into captivity, and yes, the city was destroyed. We know that Nehemiah had to rebuild it. And so we know that it was destroyed, but it was destroyed because God allowed someone to destroy it. God had been its special refuge. God had protected it. Throughout her history, God had, had looked after this city. In fact, in Isaiah 37, as we've been noticing the last couple of weeks, God said, they shall not shoot an arrow there. They're not going to be able to destroy this city. And in fact, the 185,000, as the King James Version says, woke up as dead men. Literally, God, in, in one moment of time, slew 185,000 Assyrians. And only a few remained alive to return home. Now, this battlefield, this ground surrounding Jerusalem, can you imagine what people must have thought, other kings must have thought, when they came up and they had ideas that they would attack the city of Jerusalem? And someone said, you know, the Assyrian army once thought they would do the same thing. And in one night, 185,000 died. You sure this is a city you want to attack? You sure this is something you want to do? There, there, there's a solemn nature to this. Have any of you ever visited some of the Civil War battlefields? I've had the privilege on occasion to visit some of those battlefields. And I don't know if these kinds of things get to you or not, but when you're standing there and you're thinking, and individuals begin to tell you of the number of people that lost their lives in that given location, it's overwhelming. To think. There's just a sense of, this literally is hallowed ground, isn't it? Because of the blood that's been shed there. Um, some of you have probably been to Shiloh, and there is a, a place in Shiloh that's called Bloody Pond. Now, it isn't a bloody pond, but on a given day in the Civil War, it became a bloody pond. Because there were so many injured and wounded men that crawled to that water for comfort, that the water literally turned red. It became a bloody pond. Well, when you think about that and you think about those that came up against Jerusalem and how that God delivered this city, you begin to see that God held this, this city and, and, and really not just the city, but the people within the city in a special way. They were special to Him. And God was preserving them, protecting them. And they began to realize that through their history. They began to realize that, that God was looking after them. He was taking care of them. It's interesting in Isaiah 33 and verse 18, when the Assyrians are contemplating conquering this city, they count the towers of the city. You can imagine, here's the Assyrian army. The Assyrian army is calculating how many men are we going to need to destroy Jerusalem? How many men is it going to take to conquer this city? And so they began looking at the walls and examining things. And there's someone out there who's counting the towers. But notice what this psalm says. Now this is after it's all over and Jerusalem hasn't been heard and hasn't been destroyed. Notice in verse 12, walk about Zion and go round about her. Tell the towers there. Literally count the towers there. Here the guide is saying, walk around the walls and count the towers. You see, there was an Assyrian strategist who was planning for battle against Jerusalem and he counted the towers of the wall. Now let's walk around the wall and let's count the towers. And let's make sure all the towers are still there. Which one of the towers had been broken down? Which one of the towers had been destroyed? Not a single one. Not a one of them had even been touched. The picture in the background is the Tower of David. We're studying the Psalms. It's fitting that we have the Tower of David behind us. Which one of the towers had been broken down? Which one of the towers had been... Not a one of them. They could go around and count them. Just as the enemy had done, they could count them and see that they were all still there. Untouched. God had preserved this city. The psalmist was convinced in verse 8. Notice the language. God will establish it forever. The psalmist was convinced that God was going to preserve and protect this city. If it ever ceased to exist, it would be because God chose for that to happen. God would preserve it. God would protect it. Now, when we think about the greater city of which we're privileged to be a part, what is said concerning the church? And what makes the church so great? 
Well, among other things, it's great because it shall never be destroyed. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, remember that Daniel gave the prophecy that in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It shall not be left to other people. It's not going to be left to other kingdoms. Nobody else is going to inherit, gobble this up, consume this, make this a part of their territory. It's not going to happen. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. What a great prophecy that is about the church. Now just as Jerusalem had a number of enemies that came up against her and sought to destroy her but were unsuccessful, because God preserved and protected the city, so the church has many enemies today. But the church continues to survive. It continues to exist. Why? Because God is preserving her. He's protecting her. In Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14, we have another prophecy concerning the church. And it said that His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. It's an everlasting kingdom. It's going to stand the test of time. Not physical Jerusalem, but spiritual Jerusalem. The city of which we are privileged to be citizens. Remember the promise that Jesus gave when He promised to build His church upon this rock? I will build My church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now probably the import of that passage is death is not going to prevent me from building my church. Death is not going to stop me from doing what I came to do. I'm going to establish it. I'm going to die on a cross, but I'm still going to build my church. Death's not going to prevent me from doing that. But there is a part of that passage as well that suggests that nothing is going to be able to rear up against the church and destroy it. The gates of hell. The very forces of hell are not going to be able to destroy it. It's going to stand the test of time. Just as Jerusalem was preserved from the Assyrian army, so the church is preserved from the army of Satan and preserved from those that would come against her. But now let's talk about the legislation of this city. Another thing that made this city so great, beginning in verse 9. It says, We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of thy judgments. Now, in these passages, we have three words that are often used to refer to the Word of God, that are often used to refer to the commandments of God, the precepts of God. In verse 9, we have loving kindness. You might want to notice sometimes Psalm 119, verse 88, or Psalm 119, verse 159, and you'll see loving kindness used in that way. Quicken thou me according to thy loving kindness. Other passages would say, quicken thou me according to thy word. And so here's what's being referred to. And then in verse 10, we have righteousness being used. And then in verse 11, we have judgments being used. And then in verse 14, we have God who is our God, even unto death. And so here we're talking about the legislation that God has given. What separated Jerusalem from other cities? Well, we might point out her elevation, first of all. We might point out her preservation and how that God preserved her down through the course of history. But we could also point out the legislation that was given to her. And yes, the legislation that would come out of her. You remember Isaiah 2, 2 and 3 where God's going to... The mountain of the Lord's house is going to be established on the top of the mountains. It's going to be exalted above the hills. And all nations are going to flow in it. Many people are going to say, Come you, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us of His... Ways. We'll walk in His path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. What's so special about the church? Well, the church is special because of the legislation that is found in the church. Because of the law that is found in the church. You know, there are some cities that are, are, are separate from other cities and, and are better than other cities because of the laws that are in force in those cities. 
There are some cities that are safer than other cities because of the laws that those cities have. There are some cities that are more pleasant places and more prosperous places because of the laws that are in those cities than what other places are. And certainly that was true of Jerusalem and it is true of the church today. As we think about the legislation that was given, I want you to consider some other thoughts with me. Especially I want you to consider verse 13. It says, Mark ye well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that ye may tell it to the generation following. I want you to get the picture here. It says, I want you to walk around the city. And I want you to examine the walls. I want you to take a look at the towers. I want you to see the bulwarks. I want you to really look at this city. Because I want you to be able to tell future generations of what God has done for this city. You know, how are we going to tell future generations about the church and about what's special about the church if we ourselves don't have an appreciation for it? If we haven't taken the time to walk around it and to really examine it and look at it and think about it, how are we really going to tell future generations about it if it's not something that we are impressed with? If it isn't something that, that is special to us, if it doesn't hold an elevated place in our minds, if, if it doesn't have this rich history of God's love and God's protection to us, then how are we going to tell our children about that? But I want you to think about something as well. What the Assyrians could not do by coming up against the city from the outside. You know what could happen from the inside? The people on the inside could forget about what God had done. They could fail to keep God's commandments. And what would happen to the walls of the city? The enemy couldn't break them down. But because of their neglect, they would come down. That's exactly what's going to happen. Does the church today have enemies from the outside? Sure we do. And we worry about those enemies, and rightfully so. But those aren't the enemies that pose the greatest threat to the church. That's not why the church in so many places today is, is in ruins. You know as well as I do why the church in so many places is not what it ought to be. And it's because the people on the inside are not what they're supposed to be. It's because the people on the inside have not taught their children about the church and about the position that God has for the church and of how good God's been to the church. They've not taught their children that. Because they've not taught their children that, the walls are falling down. They're falling down out of neglect rather than because the enemy has stormed and overpowered the walls, falling down for a different reason. Consider some passages. Psalm 71 and verse 18. Psalm 71 and verse 18. Here's the psalmist. He says, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. He said, God, let me tell the next generation about your power and about your strength. There's the idea of this psalm. Notice Psalm 78 and verses 4 and 6. It says, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. Notice in verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who shall arise and declare them to their children. Notice Psalm 79 in verse 13. So we, thy people, and sheep of thy pasture, will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Psalm 109 and verse 13. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. God's plan was for each generation to teach the next generation what they themselves had learned. Now, how many generations does it take for it to be lost? Just one, right? If my parents taught me about the greatness of the church, and I believe that, and it's a part of me, but if I don't teach that to my children, 
then am I realistic in believing that they will then in turn teach it to their children? If I don't give it to them, they're not going to give it to their children. And so it only takes that one generation for this appreciation for the city of God and what God's done to be lost. That's the seriousness of this psalm. But consider very quickly, I want you to notice a couple of passages because I think they bring this out well. One is Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verses 6 through 8. We'll just read verse 8. Moses is telling them about how special they are as God's people. And this is what he says. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgment so righteous as all this law which I set before thee this day? Moses says, you want to know what makes you special as a nation? The fact that God gave you this law. This law makes you special. Who else did God give this law to, Moses says? You know what makes us special today as God's people? It's the law that we've been given. That's what makes it special. Think about Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. We have been given a better covenant which was established upon better promises. That's what we've been given. Now, I know why the church is special today. Because she has an elevated position. She's special because of how God has preserved her and protected her and taken care of her down through the years. And yes, she is special because of the legislation that God's given to her. God's given to her the good news of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We've been blessed with this better covenant that's built on better promises. That's why we're special. That's why we hold the position that we do. That's why we are so blessed and so honored to be a part of the great city of God, to be a part of the church. I thank you very much for your attention tonight.